And hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Pumpkin Coptercast, the only video game show. So it may not be July, but we're going to celebrate. It may not be June anymore. We're going to celebrate Pride Month anyway. I'm joined again by Kyle, everyone's favorite trans mask duck. Who has hello, re- hello. Who has recovered from earlier, a few months ago, a few weeks ago, when they talked with me and Tom about Pokemon the third movie for over two hours. Well, you know, that was one of those things where you could talk about it for over two hours. I mean, let's be real here. Like, anti, there's a lot to go over. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I I, I could have talked about that for a really long time. Um, You know, I could talk about a lot of things for a really long time. That's just how it goes. Yep. And so before we get started, Kyle, would you... You have a choice. Would you like to play Yu-Gi-Oh! or Dark Souls again, or would you like some random trivia? Ooh. You know, I always really like Yu-Gi-Oh! or Dark Souls. Let's go ahead and do that. I mean, we can play both, theoretically, but I like Yu-Gi-Oh! and Dark Souls. Okay. Because this always blows my mind. Like, it, it really does always blow my mind, this game. All right, let's see. So for those who are not in the know, this is when I ask any guests I have about the name of a monster, and they have to figure out if it's from Dark Souls or Yu-Gi-Oh! Because if one, the one thing the franchises have in common is they all sound is that uh, they all sound like a shakespearean actor just drank a bottle of something and not a good bottle of something (laughs) so we'll start with here's the first one so black dragon collar serpent Yu-Gi-Oh. yep is in one of the structured decks I have that can only be described as, you know, the Fire Emblem, Corinth from Fire Emblem, but Yu Gi Oh! Uh, I love it. Are you okay, Debbie? Can you cut recording? Are you all right? Oh, yeah, I'm fine. I just have okay. to talk slightly quieter. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, uh, keep going. Let's see. Let's see. There's a list. Uh, let's see. Let's see, what are the weirdest sounding ones? All right, here's one. Uh, While Debbie looks up the list, I'll tell you, my favorite part of this game is genuinely, like, how you can connect two things that seem are seemingly so different, and then they come off as so similar. Like, that's, that's what blows my mind. Because I'll admit, I am not familiar with Yu-Gi-Oh! Or Dark Souls. But whenever Debbie talks about it, it makes me really want to be. So that's what's interesting. All right, here's the next one. Cosmo Dark Lady. Sailor Moon. Nope, it is Yu-Gi-Oh. And <laughs> so there is a... So pretty much if it exists in fiction, Yu-Gi-Oh has done something with it. And this is like... Imagine... Uh, the Wicked Witch of the West and Darth Vader. That's actually really cool. It's one of the best things I've ever seen in my life. And there's one. uh, Yeah. All right. We'll do one last one. Uh, hmm. Let's see. Seath the Scaleless, Yu-Gi-Oh! or Dark Souls? Dark Souls. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's because of the scalus. That was what gave it away for me. Mm hmm. All right. And yeah. And that is that game for today. And um, so, yeah, this is mo mostly about video games, but one or both of us will probably go on several rants. And I guess I shall kick things off with something I noticed right away. So. Hold on, let's see. So for those of you not in the know, they just ever so recently, uh, you know, Japan heard um, back in the ancient year of 2021, you know, Japan finally answered our call and we got English releases of the Great Ace Attorney Adventures, which uh, a duology of games detailing, you know, the the nineteenth yes. the nineteenth century ancestor of Phoenix Wright, Ryunosuke Naruto, and he teams up with you know legally distinct mystery solver uh, Herlock Sholmes. Because I don't think it, um, I'm not sure if it was in public, if the character was in public domain by the time this game was originally made. And the Phoenix Wright games have always been just, you know, I don't know if, Kyle, imagine if, you know, one of your coworkers asked you to explain, like, the concept of gay subtext in media. You could okay. just, you could just show them any of, the main because every single one of the main characters has a same sex crush or it just it feels like it just because of how they act you get phoenix has edgeworth and they've got the whole their childhood friends thing and this is extra relevant because the three games are just announced for a re-release apollo justice has clavier gavin which Apollo is, you know, probably one of the characters who act, tries to actively not be a goofball, even though he fails. And Clavier Gavin is not only a prosecutor, but he's also, you know, like the lead, the, the lead guitarist of a extremely popular band made up of other prosecutors because anime. I mean, you know, if he doesn't have a band do we really want it? Because that is, that's like, I don't know. It, it, this is making it sound like slice of life meets Ace Attorney and I'm living for it. Yep. And you know, the, let's say Athena Sykes has, you know, her childhood friend, Juniper. And, and I think we finally graduated from like gay subtext to gay text because in the second game of the Great Ace Attorney Adventures, Ryunosuke's fr friend slash judicial assistant Susato Mikotoba, who I can only who is could accurately be described as a sixteen year old can of nineteenth century Japanese whoop ass. <laughs> uh, at the end of the first game, she has to return home to Japan for a bit, and her, and you know, one of her friends ends up getting accused of murder, and she has to defend them. But because this is 19th century Japan times, she has to disguise herself as a dude because, you know, f because again, you know, old timey times, things were not as advanced as they were. Uh, so she just. Disguises herself as Ryunosuke's cousin Ryotaro and her childhood friend, whose name is Rei Membani. And just think about that for a minute. Okay. I think because most of the character, most side characters' names are puns. So, Ibani, could you explain the pun to me? Rei Membani. Yes. Just say it over and over again. See if you can get it. Ray and Bonnie. Membani. Uh, Ray. Ba okay. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, that's good. 
And That's really good. <laughs> Look. <laughs> <laughs> And when, you know, Ray meets her defense attorney, she's at first smit. She's at first, like, incredibly smitten. And then when eventually, you know, Susato has to reveal, oh, it's really me. She, you know, takes a second to process that, and then she continues to be smitten. And hold on, I get... There's... Yep, found it. So... Posted this before, but this is a piece of like actual like art from like I think the art book. Posting it in the chat window here. Okay. So, this, so just look at it. Look at Ray looking at Susato. Oh my goodness. Yep. So she's like legitimately fawns over her, and Susato even has to explicitly tell her to just you know stop looking at me with the. With those blushing cheeks and soulful eyes, or something like that, and I'm just I mean, like, that's the, the, that's that's like, and that's how it should be, you know. I mean, like, mm-hmm. it it's it doesn't it's not explicitly focused on gay, it's not explicitly focused on anything. It's just a genuine like meet cute relationship. I'm loving this. Yep. Uh, no, I love it just because in Phoenix, right? Everyone acts. Whatever emotion a person has, it's always the extreme of it. Like, you know, one of the characters, like Edgeworth and the character in this one, Barak Van Zeeks, just like the most stoic. Like, Athena in the Phoenix Wright games and Phoenix's daughter, Trucy, which is just a little bit terrifying that someone like Phoenix is at has been a dad for like eight years now. Like they're just like the goofballs. And yeah, I thought that was neat. And I just been thinking and like the Phoenix Wright games have been on my mind. I mean just a little pivot like oh gosh, it's already been twelve days because, you know, almost two weeks ago I they like, I mean, just the gay representation of Phoenix has made me think about representation in general because, you know, a few days ago, I had a little chat with someone on the video and we did a character analysis on, you know, a character that appears in Phoenix Wright Spirit of Justice, which is one of my favorites mm-hmm. of the series so far. We got Uendo Tornado, a character that has actual, explicit, legitimate, act, like, disassociative identity disorder. Wow. Like, you meet the entire system. And that's, for, for a video game, that's actually, that's really fucking cool. That's a really big deal. And, you know. Like, you don't see positive, I mean, like, you rarely if ever see systems represented positively in media. And then to have them in a game like Phoenix Wright, that's awesome. And yeah, yeah, I'm the purse and red blood cherry. I uh, get system, like a real life system, joined me and said that you know, again, it's Phoenix right, not a hundred percent accurate because Phoenix right in video games, but you know, as accurate as something like that could possibly be, and you know, and yeah, I mean, and I thought it was worth noting because Phoenix right talks about you know just mental health stuff with surprising sensitivity because we know that Edgeworth has a genuine phobia of earthquakes to the point where he basically like shuts down mentally whenever one happens. I think you know Athena like apparently had some when she was a young and her backstory is that uh, she can like hear emotional strife in in a person as noise and so she had to wear like special headphones to block it out like because sensory overload and yeah and you know that actually reminds me of another example also from you know 2021 um you know the world was you know delighted when double fine did the impossible and brought a sequel to the critically acclaimed Psychonauts. Yes. And yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And 
yeah, we're introduced. Uh, yeah, and we're introduced. Well, we meet both of them separately before they reunite, but we're introduced to an explicit gay couple. And I mean, this isn't really said or commented on, but I think in the world of, I think Psychonauts takes place in like late 80s or 90s ish. But I don't know, I just, a little bit of trivia, but we meet. Like two of the founders of the Psychonauts, like in general, we meet. I uh, just got you gotta see pictures of these of these men. We meet first. First, we meet Helmet Fullbear, who the world's most looks like the world's most ginger Viking. So part of the Debbie clan. Respect. Probably. And yeah, and we actually and, you know, Raz discovers that the two are married just because, you know, it, it's about literally going into a person's mind and you know, while Raz helps Helmet sort out some his own like sensory overload due to plot reasons, which I will not get into because play that game, please. It's awesome. I can like the mental vaults, which show you like key moments in a person's life. It shows that, you know, before he became one of the psychonauts helmet was like a concert, a musician of some kind. And you see like one of the members of the audience was his, at the time admirer and eventually husband uh bob zanato uh um, the uncle of lily zanato rez's adorable and very prone to violence girlfriend okay and it shows that he was event he was you know an audience goer and then you know they met through work as the two of them were found two of the founders of psychonauts and then eventually you go into Raz goes into Bob's head to help him clear his own demons and you know just see I and guess, that's that's good uh, no 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 like, and see that's because that's good representation because it's not it doesn't focus necessarily on gender or anything and it bears repeating um and it's also a really sweet story I really like that story it reminds me of the Matrix a little bit actually going into people's heads and things. Uh, yep, and oh no, two sad old dudes. <laughs> uh, yeah, and Raz goes into Bob's head and just like if you do play Psychonauts, the game itself has a content warning right before you play it because it is about you know going into a pe- literally going into people's heads and seeing visual representations of their mental illnesses or just like the horrible, horrible traumas they have seen in life. So, you know, just, I'll only give like the lightest of spoilers, but you know, because of the stuff, what happened, you know, a long time ago, Bob, unfortunately, followed, was going down the same path his mom did and, you know, just went, became like you know alcoholic to the point where it started just like screwing up everything around him to the point where his brother like the head of the psychonauts had to like fire him until you know he could you know just get help and i bring that up because you know just a lot of while you're exploring bob's mind like you find like facsimiles of characters and they say things, not the actual characters in the game, but you know, characters he hasn't met, but you know, when you talk to them, they say things like how he thinks they see him. And you know, eventually you fight like a giant manifestation of all of his issues and like his self-loathing and like part of it uh, and like part of like the monster that you fight says that you know helmet never loved him and you know that's what actually convinces bob to realize that you know these like his mental it like 
the mental issues and the problem are just like something he need something he can get past because they're ultimately just self-loathing talking and not how people actually think of him and like what actually gets him to fight back against his demons is like saying that you know helmet never loved him and that he know he knows for a fact that they did because like one of the scenes raz ends up like walking through is like bob exchanging his wedding vows to helmet which is just really beautiful because this is before this is when like before bob before all of the psychonauts suffered the horrible trauma that is that kicks off the events of the second game and you know he just talks about like how the feelings he had for helmet he thought they were wrong and then he realizes like how good helmet was and how good he was for him and it's just really beautiful just like just him just you know saying the vows that you would say at a wedding just to express just how lucky you are to have that person and that's just really nice and yeah that's really sweet that's yep. really really sweet and yeah it's just like all of this all of the backstories of the psychonauts are just pretty sad just because but I think it's really beautiful, and I don't know. I just, I, yeah, and I loved. Okay. And, and no, no, I was pretty sure this takes. I think it takes place like the Psychonauts games takes place, you know, like in years before, like gay rights started like becoming as you know. A, as part of everything as they are now but you know what i like is that you know and the game's res is 10 and so when he's like confronted with it and he's like fighting like bob's mental demons he just he just immediately leaps to bob's defense and be like how can you say that about bob you love him and just because at this point like raz has literally gone and like physically punched like the mental demons of like a lot of people so yeah, i think that contributed to him just being like a, a very open-minded 10 year old right right well i mean that's it, it i think that's a beautiful story that's that's just uh, do you think that it affects do you think it affects raz like do you think it affects his own choices in life do you think maybe he looks at them and sees um, you know, see, learns things about himself. Like, could you see this character as someone who might be a part of our little alphabet soup family? And Raz probably, because, well, I mean, in the con, well, like, Raz is a psychic, and, and, you know, just the backstory is that, you know, a lot of, a lot of Raz's family from, like, Back when his like grandparents were like around the age his parents are now, like psychics like killed his family and cursed him to go into water. And his mom makes like real, just, I don't know, ugly, like passive aggressive comments. Like the mom from every, the grandma from Everybody Loves Raymond about psychics. Ooh. Like his older brother just makes like. I don't know, what I could only describe as derogatory comments about psychics and I think and they do like you know the superpowers as metaphor thing that something does but I think like unlike a lot of comic books it I think it does it better because you know psychic powers and psychonauts are so closely tied to like a person's actual state of mind mm -hmm. and like it's revealed that his older sister probably saying it wrong, but Frazzy is a psychic, but, you know, she hasn't told anyone, even though it's, like, an open secret. And because they're, like, afraid, because she's just afraid of how mom would react, even though, like, Raz's dad is a psychic. And, you know, just quick trivia, like, Raz's dad is voiced by Armin Shimmerman. Okay. Also known as Quark. 
No, stop. Really? Yep. So that was just like the biggest surprise for me because he's just, he's just friggin' like, well, because he's an absolute, he's a juggernaut. I mean, like, you know, Cork has such a unique voice. And like, um, you know, anybody who's a big fan of Star Trek, you know, how can you not love Cork? Like, Cork's bar. Yep. And he's like in the game. And he's, and the, like, Rat. Like, a lot of this game is about Raz's family, so he's, like, in the game more, and it's awesome. And, like, when he talks to, when Raz talks to his dad about it, they, like, you know, agree to let Frazzy tell everyone that she's a psychic on their own, which, you know. That's I, that's a big, that's a big queer metaphor right there. That is a big queer metaphor, making sure that people have the right to come out on their own terms. That's, that's mm-hmm. huge. That's, that was a really progressive little game. I had no I, idea it was this deep. I like the fact that they use like metaphors and like actual representation as opposed to just, you know, like superpowers as metaphor for thing. And oh, sorry, you go ahead. Well, no, I was going to say that that I think it's getting tired. Like I was thinking not in terms of representation. I mean, well, it's always in terms of representation, but I went and saw Elemental a little while ago. Mm-hmm. Diving oh, I briefly off today. the. Huh? I saw it again today. What'd you think? Oh, I thought it was great. Like, I loved it the first time I saw it, and I also liked it now. And, like, I don't know, a little treat is that, you know, one of the people who voice acted, like, part of Wade's family said that, like, they are non-binary, and the character they voiced was non-binary. And that was... And, like, you hear Wade addressing, like, them as a sibling, as a... When after he's in, also introduced his like brother, and I thought that was neat. I have n- I did not pick up on that. So what you're telling me is I have to see it again. I I was against the idea. I thought it was really cute. I just but again for initially even until I watched it and I realized how different it was and how personal it was, especially from the director. Initially I was like, oh, this is just supernatural creatures metaphor, and it's like no, it's it really is more than that, and. So, but to see a combination of both, especially in video games that so many people interact with, is really important because it gives you a name to something that you don't really know. Like if you're if you're taking Elemental, for instance, and there was a point where I remember I was looking at, a, at one of the scenes where I think it's the grandma, and she's like, you know, don't marry fire, um, or promise me you'll marry fire. I guess that happened to the director. Because I guess his mom was like, promise me you'll marry a Korean. And we're not qualified to speak on that here, granted. We're not qualified to speak on that. I I did find it very interesting, though, that, you know, that's something that people would say. And so to hear it was really jarring. But to hear it as a metaphor, it's like, well, OK, it doesn't really have the same power. It doesn't have the same, have the same punch or the same meaning. Um, and people wouldn't be ready for that. But to hear it for the LGBTQ and to have it be in actual terms is just really important because it gives names to things that people don't really know so it's like metaphor powers as metaphor is great but eventually you're gonna have to use names so to have this here this little game that i honestly genuinely just thought was a throwaway game coming out with all these deep thoughts is is you know what platform can i buy this on because uh it's um I think at least most of the big ones. Um, Psychonauts 2 is on PS4, Xbox, Cloud Gaming, and PC. Like, I personally got it on PC. My PC is... Well, okay. I mean, I can I can move some stuff around on my Steam Deck, because... I have a Steam Deck and I need to be playing on my Steam Deck more, but I'd definitely be interested in playing something a little more psychological, especially especially if you're telling me that it combines both, because both are fine. I mean, to be gay is to be nuanced, obviously. To be gay is to be, um, you know, to have layers. And it's like, you know, gay people can have superpowers. They can be themselves. But, you know, most of the time it's just power is metaphor. So I don't know. I don't know where the power is metaphor rant came from, to be honest, but... It's actually really touching to hear that we're not dismissing the terms and we're not dismissing the feelings and we're not, you know, letting things go like that. I think that's that's great. Yeah, and 
Another example I'm just calling to mind looking at my my, my many lists of games that I've played is something that like surprised me in a good way was, you know, just a few months ago I played through Dodgeball Academia and which is basically like you know, what if like a sports anime and like a Saturday morning cartoon anime and you sort of mashed them together. Okay, so we're talking Haikyuu meets uh, Pokemon or something along those lines. Cool, cool, cool. Yep, and the play is Otto, who looks like he could be related to KO from OKKO. And like in a school dedicated to dodgeball, because why not? And I mean, like the first thing is like nice little detail is that, you know, all of like, literally all of the bathrooms you see because you know school like all the bathrooms are like you know gender neutral bathrooms like you see the sign right up there which i thought was Mm -hmm. like neat and i don't know there's this moment where you go on to where Otto and friends go onto the roof where they have all the secret like dodgeball matches with illegal rules because because sports and actually see like two female NPCs are in like I told you this is a bad place to have our date because you know plot was happening let's go yep and then there is this like one little moment where like Otto finds like a note but he what looks like a love note but turns out to just be a trick by an antagonistic force and he thinks you know Boris, like the resident tough guy, sent to be like, "You like me," and instead of just reacting in like, like shock and disgust, like you would, like I don't know, a decade or two earlier, Boris says, "You're not my type," <laughs> and it's I don't know, pretty good. I mean, it was just good representation, this and a good general representation too, because like one of like the teacher characters. Who looks like yeah? Who looks like I don't know. He has like a mustache that looks like it's also turning in the mutton chops. Is like he's in a wheelchair, and you see like in the school grounds, it has like those like that sort of like that sort of like I don't know lift, that chair lift for people who can't walk upstairs, and like all the classrooms have like a ramp, so he can, so like that teacher can just go and go up to the podium and give lectures on whatever because he deliver he deals with like the science of dodgeball of which there's That's surprisingly awesome. a lot. and yeah i brought that it just reminded me of that also just go play dodgeball academia if you want like a game that is written like a like the sort of anime you'd watch back when saturday morning cartoons existed Saturday morning cartoons do still exist and let's hope that they stay existing because the way that the streaming platforms are going, you know, you want to make sure that we get to keep things like, Hey Arnold and such and such. So everybody, you know, keep this. If if you get an opportunity folks, ladies and gentlemen, they's and thems and all the others in between, um, make sure to grab your digital media, like solid actual media of your favorite stuff. So if you like Saturday morning cartoons, buy the DVDs and the Blu-rays. Mm-hmm. Um, that's awesome though. Like that's really really cool. And yep. Do you have any video? Ge- well, okay. Any examples you can think of. So I was thinking. I was thinking of. I have been. I I got my Steam Deck, and I've been more engrossed in. Um, you know, upcoming upcoming games. I played Bendy and the Dark Revival. I think that's the last game that like I really played through. Um, which was interesting because Bendy's protagonist is a female protagonist, or at least she's a female presenting protagonist, and she does identify as as female. But the way that they present her kind of comes off that she she is both a she, but she is also a part of the Ink Demon. So if you're not familiar, late folks, with the um, if you're not familiar with Benny, the Benny and the Ink Machine series, Benny and the Ink Machine is a mystery surrounding an abandoned cartoon studio involving a man named Joey Drew, who is a discount Walt Disney, who struggled to create 
the perfect cartoon characters and to, you know, build a very realistic world. Eventually, he settled on doing this by building a theme park, which would bankrupt the studio. But in order to bankrupt the studio, he basically sold his studio, uh, his ability, you know, his employee, his studio, all of the land he had purchased and his employees into uh, a sort of servitude with a demon. And the fandom has definitely dis- made some decisions about these characters because, number one, one of my favorite characters, music composer Sammy Lawrence, is pretty much the fandom has decided that he is queer. Um, and I've seen some lovely transmasculine um, created representation of, of him, which heals my heart on a level that is um, very personal. But the the way that the characters you know the, the the it's a mystery it's like you know is this person did this person actually did these employees actually become big monsters who are you what is your relation to all of this and it's very much about identity you know this is the theme that we're talking about with Debbie that it's identity we're talking about the identity and we're talking about what makes you you and that's really the biggest theme of dark revival because dark revival focuses on Joey's daughter quote unquote and Joey his daughter goes on an adventure through the abandoned studio. Some things are different. Some things are the same. For someone who is non-binary, it meant a lot because you have characters that transform into something else. And in some cases, it's against their will. And in some cases, they've accepted it. And, you know, they've owned the, the and many in the many cases regard them as, you know, their true, their true selves. So it's all about accepting things. But the reason why I talk about Audrey is that Towards the end of the game, spoiler, spoiler, spoilers, even though the game has been out since November of last year. Spoiler, 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 spoilers. Uh, Debbie, say it with me. Spoiler, spoilers. Spoilers. Um, <laughs> spoilers. Um, basically, it's implied, at least to me, that the Ink Demon and Audrey come from the same place and that you know, Joey was making Audrey and he very clearly made Audrey female, but there's a point where you merge with with the ink demon and you really kind of get the idea that at least in Bendy, you know, people, when people are cartoons, you know, they can be whatever they can look, however they want to look and be whatever they want to be. And so I was just kind of like, a lot of people were sitting there looking at Audrey's, you know, Audrey's gay. And I'm like, yeah, I would love that. I would love to see actual queer representation in Bendy because so many people have assigned it to these characters who very clearly are struggling with, you know, different mental disorders and different things. And the added bonus of having a a, uh, a boss that has sold you into inky servitude to a demonic entity bent on... Um, making you a part of its perpetual kingdom so there's a lot of mental health stuff involved in it for me and there's a lot of what what reads to me is queer subtext at least to dark revival so that's the that's the new game that i've been playing Mm -hmm. where you know you play as audrey who is a who is identifies as female but is very clearly part of this demonic entity uh, who presents as male and um the the demon is non-binary. Bendy is non-binary. Bendy the demon is non-binary. And it really shows in the fact that, you know, we have Audrey who is towards the end of the game, you really do play you play as Audrey, and the Audrey has merged with the Ink Demon. And the Ink Demon basically is tromping around the studio, murdering, smushing all of its followers, trying to because Audrey's trying to get out and Audrey's trying to trap Audrey's trying to trap the demon in, you know, its lower domain. So it, it's it's an interesting fuse that I chose to read a little bit queer. And that the fandom has chosen definitely like, you know, Audrey being gay, yes. Definitely a lot of queer ships in big name indie horror things that people would really wish. Like, I don't know what it is, especially because of the creator. I really don't know what it is about FNAF that has attracted such a huge queer following. Like, I don't know what it is about FNAF or Bendy or any of these indie games that has attracted such a massive queer following that people would immediately ascribe queer relationships to these characters, especially with the movie coming out. And especially with FNAF, because with FNAF in the movie, like, you get 
everyone's you finally have faces to all of these characters and people are just like man imagine if they made this character gay like everybody wanted them to be in fan works and it's like let's be honest here you know they probably won't but you know that, that potentiality and especially because both of the people so i sit here and i jump from bendy which is my legitimate you know has been a source of very real queer comfort to me to to the fnaf movie i will mention that both uh the the creator scott cawthorn has distanced himself from the film he's barely spoken on it it's mostly been the studio that's spoken on it which i think is a very smart move on his part um this is like one of his last projects that he's doing before he leaves the franchise for good and retires and um I think that turning it over to the studio that he's chosen to run it is great. And turning it over to the actors and stuff that they've, they've got doing this movie because... <laughs> so Matthew Lillard, and yes, that's Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. Matthew Lillard was in an episode of Dragula. Now, Debbie, my friend, are you familiar with Dragula? Not even a little. Dragula is like RuPaul's Drag Race, but it's horror-themed. And basically, the um, he plays a guy who is with his wife, <clears throat> is with his character's wife, and they're trying to spice up their marriage, and they end up grabbing this big honking guy, <clears throat> who who's like played by a really famous act, a really famous horror actor. His name is Derek Mears, <clears throat> and he's you know like playing his character as bisexual. <clears throat> and it turns out that you know all of the innuendos and stuff flee to the fact that the husband and wife are actually serial killers and they're trying to take him out but it was just it, it's just very plain with the ca the campy elements of of being queer and horror and the great thing about indie games is that you know it's, there, it's so, there's something about them, all of them that is very very queer and so i've been playing dark revival and that's at least to me is read very clear even if all the representation is overt to non-existent but the one that is very clearly obviously that i has been my comfort game um that i keep restarting is stardew valley mm -hmm. i love stardew valley i lo love that doesn't matter who you romance you can romance any of the single characters and it's just treated as totally normal and it's very very simple and it's very very sweet and you know i think my only downside is that i would love to see you know more interactions discussing it but you know you kind of get in you can kind of get hints throughout the game that like you know this is the the, the there there's good and bad points to it i guess and but I just love that you can romance, you know, anybody. I mean, like my newest farmer, my farmer before my new, my farmer before this farmer, she dated Abigail, who was who is the goth, as anyone who's played Stardew Valley knows. And romancing her with pumpkins and taking her to the fair and then taking her to the flower dance is really, like the the whole idea. You've played Stardew Valley, right? A little bit. Okay, so the whole idea behind Stardew Valley is that you know you're a farmer, you move, you you work for an Amazon knockoff, and you move to Stardew Valley to like start a farm and kind of live your life, and um, you kind of clear the way, and then you get to know the townsfolk and you date the townsfolk, and one of the interactions that you have at the beginning of the year is the flower festival, and basically it's just it's it's supposed to be this very traditional dance but you can dance whoever you, with you know whoever you happen to be dating at the time so it's like you know if you have a heterosexual farmer and you're dating you know the opposite of your gender um then you dance you know very traditionally but if you're playing the same sex characters and you're you know romancing abby for instance then you're both sitting there and you're both you know, one of you's in a dress and one of you, and it's just, it, it's just good. It's just a very good, calming, very sweet game where it, 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 without the Dragon Age elements of dating people in the midst of like fire and brimstone, which I think is really nice. So that's, those are my two queer uh, movie games. <laughs> or those are my, my, my two games that have been my big, um, 
queer games this this pride month that we are leaving but especially stardew valley with everything going on in the world has just been kind of like a nice reprieve from the unfortunate circumstances that i don't really want to get into that we're finding ourselves in but in terms of games i'm really excited to and i would love to hear what you think about this is the new uh, mario oh <laughs> uh, yeah the super mario bros wonder what um, is your take on Super Mario Bros. Wonder? Oh, I'm excited. It looks pretty. You got to put Mario, Luigi, Toad, Peach, Daisy. Like, it looks like they're adding a whole bunch of new stuff, new collectibles, new power-ups. You can turn into an elephant. Oh, that looks cool. I'm really excited. And I think I keep thinking about, see, folks, Debbie's whole thing is that Mario actually has some really excellent queer representation. So I'm really interested to see, you know, if they continue that tradition with this new Mario game, because I think that that would be really fun. I think maybe in the RPGs or like a big, because they do pretty good with RPGs. We got, I don't know, well, since Super Mario RPG is being remade, I can, I am, Hoping against hope that, you know, we'll get a, either a remaster or a port of Thousand Year Door because you know, then in a whole new generation of gamers can see, you know, best girl Vivian and, you know, she was actually the character that taught me like what the word transgender actually meant. So I've, I remember, I remember you telling me about that because it's, and, and see what I like when you're telling me this, what I like about that is that. You know, when you compare that to like Psychonauts and now you have visual representations of characters that are like and actual words for it. Like that's that to me, I'm I'm in the mood to celebrate growth today. Like I'm in the mood to celebrate the wins, however tiny and small. So I think that, you know, that's a plus that's a plus, you know what I mean? Yeah, and I mean, yeah, I think like, I'm pretty sure, like, Mario himself was, like, somewhere under, like, the many different rainbow flags. And, you know, and, like, every version except, like, I think the American version and at least one other, like, Mario, like, comforts best girl Vivian who can punch someone so hard they light on fire uh, after, like, you know, because... Like her sister Bedlam, again, except in the Mario, except in like the American one, like like her, her sister like explicitly misgenders her, uh, as opposed to like in the American just like generic you're ugly insults, which is bad but for a different reason. And you know, yeah, and you know, like Mario, like Mario's friends' only hesitation is not that but just because you know she was a part of the group that tried to beat them up a whole lot and earlier in the game and like again this doesn't necessarily mean it's like lgbt plus everything but you know just adds more fuel to the fire that you know in super mario odyssey like one of the costumes you can get after you beat like the main game is you know a replica of princess peach's dress that is explicitly stated that you know mario had it altered to fit his body measurements and like the dude just rocks it i don't mind saying of course and yeah i mean yeah and since tears of the kingdom is out it reminds me of you know the scene in uh, Breath of the Wild, where Wayne cast the dress, dress, dress like a woman in order to get into like the Gerudo Valley, because the last time the there was a male Gerudo, it was Ganondorf, who is basically the devil now. Yeah, and you know this like this the person what gives Link to outfit says that like oh you're a pretty girl and like. Link actually gets like bashful, like doesn't look the person in the eye, and you can see him blushing. Like, okay, that, so that. I know Link is supposed to be mass. I know Link is supposed to be biologically male, but can we talk for a second about how the trans community has embraced like a transgender Link 
because I think that's absolutely fantastic. And I, I am the last person to be familiar with anything Legend of Zelda, but would you agree that the community has kind of embraced Link as like a transgender individual, especially because if, if memory serves, the only people who've done Link's voices are female, right? I actually am not entirely sure. I mean, like one of the early, one of like the earliest fan arts I've seen is you know of Tears of the Kingdom is you know Link and Zelda derping about, and it shows like Link with like top surgery scars, and Zelda's like, oh, maybe I should do that. I've heard about it, and then Link makes a joke that he did it himself with the Master Sword. <laughs> It's, that's know, not the safe way to do that link <laughs> trust me someone looking into it that is not the safe way to do that oh so hardcore and you know then there's like all the fan art they drew of like link married to his nine foot tall shark husband which, we love it yep and I just, I have to, before any discussion of Zelda, and I swear, you know what, I have time tomorrow. Happy day we're not celebrating, because we're not celebrating it, but happy day off that I have where I get paid, because it's a federal holiday. Um, I will probably crack open my copy of Breath of the Wild, and just, just so I can finally appease you, Debbie, my friend, and mm-hmm. everyone else, so I can finally say I've played something Zelda. Just for all of you, because <laughs> I have not. I have truly not. Uh, and I'm not sure, ch- like, I'm not sure if this, like, particular piece of fan art exists anymore, just because I'm actively trying to find it right now. But, you know, thinking about this and looking at pictures of best girl Vivian, there's another, there's, like, a fan art of, you know, Madame Fleury, like, I don't know, like probably like a literal example of big, beautiful woman, because just look at her like there is like like a fan art of just like, I wish I could find it because it's so good. But there's like a fan art of just like her like braiding Vivian's hair. I love it. When you find it, send it to me because that actually sounds cute. And because, you know, just, I don't know, I think because, I think, I don't know, I think Madame Fleury is, it doesn't say how old she is, but I think she is, like, one of the older characters. She's as old as a mom with, like, grown-up kids would be if she was one, and, like, it's like a few of the like I think almost all the characters except for like the adorable baby Yoshi are like adults. Like, oh yeah, another thing. Now that I'm thinking about it, another thing I'm, that's just rattling around in my brain is that in Thousand Year Door, like the speculation that you know other best girl Goombella is by because you know she. Because she and like pretty much every other like female partner in Mario's party just has a crush on the guy because the sure. there's, there's few things more attractive than will selflessly fight for you and and you know she and when she like tattle and when you know she has that ability in the game that like Kumbario in the first Paper Mario game had where she can give you the lowdown on any character and you know when she. Like rattles off like um, Vivian's trivia when you fight her as like part of a mini boss crew. Um, uh, yeah, she explicitly was like, "Oh yeah, this is Vivian. She's the youngest of the Shadow Sirens. She uses fire, and she's cute, really cute. She might even be cuter than I have than I am." And she's like, "Wait, what am I saying?" That's not that's not subtle. That's not subtle at all, girl. Yep. Uh, well, you know. Yeah. So we've got you with your actual positive representation and me with my subtle representation that comforts me but is also like not confirmed. In a perfect world, Debbie, let me ask mm-hmm. you. What would you consider 
which of the games would you consider that you that you've talked about? Which of the games would you consider to be like ideal representation for you? Uh, it is. Uh, not entirely certain. I'm like the most. I'm like the person to ask, just because. You know, I like if you've ever met me in real life, I look like almost every redhead character in every cartoon for the past 50 years. Like, all I need is, like, a big red shirt and, like, a big, long red shirt with, like, puffy arm, with, like, puffy shoulders, and I look like, you know, Ponyo. I look like a grown-up Ponyo who had some major revelations after the movie in her growing <laughs> years. Uh, that's probably be a very easy cosplay to pull off. Uh... My roommate yeah. actually cosplays as Panya. <laughs> uh, it's a great cosplay. She does it very well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so I definitely, yeah. I definitely recommend it for you because I can see it. Uh, well, no. But... What, what I'm asking, what I'm asking you is, what? It, it, don't think in terms of physicality. Think in terms of like mentally, what would make you the most comfortable? Mm. What would you want to see? Uh... I'm not. Hmm. I'm not entirely sure. There hasn't been. There hasn't been a whole lot I can think of. Like when I come speaking for myself, for myself personally, I. I generally, I generally don't see myself in a lot of stuff. Not because like bad reasons, but just because I just simply don't see it like i just like unless i'm talking about it like with you or just in like some other discussion like i generally don't think about that part of myself all that much just because there's so much other real life stuff to worry about and but yeah i'm not entirely sure i think Hmm. that's fair Uh, that's fair and it's it's a hard question to answer yeah uh, hmm. Yeah, I couldn't, couldn't really tell you. Well, for me, ideal, I don't know, I think for me, ideal representation would be, <laughs> would be making Sammy and Bendy and Ink Machine transmasculine, which isn't going to happen, but. Um, just be not even because the creator wouldn't want to, and it's not a part of the story the creator would want to tell, but also because being trans in the era that the game takes place in is an entirely different experience with so many more obstacles than than there would be today. But this is a character I, ident- I identify with and I really like, um, and I would like. I was sitting there thinking about it. And I was like, hey, this would actually be really cool if this was the thing. But sometimes you just have to settle for canon that fans create. And sometimes you just have to settle for, you know, that kind of thing. And I think you should take some time, you know, off of this or otherwise. And you should ask yourself, you know, what would you like to see that would make you really happy? Not just because it's good representation for other people, but what would make you really happy specifically? I just wanted to interrupt by saying I found the picture of Vivian and Flurry from Thousand Year Door that I was talking to you about. Oh, that's cute. Oh, yeah. that's really cute. I uh, wish they sold prints of it so I could get it for it. And I don't know. I guess while we're yeah, talking, I... I guess while Ooh. we're ta- sorry. While no, we're ta- please. I'm sorry. I interrupted you. While we're talking about head cannons, like I guess like the Debbie family is just like the ultimate head cannon because you know like. A year or two ago, I commissioned, like, I commissioned an artist to, like, draw the Debbie family. Uh, we got Big Debbie, which is me, married to, like, the, married to, like, Milo from Pokemon Sword. And the thing they have in common is that they're both just, like, incredibly buff and ginger. And, we love it. And, like, the fan art. Which I actually have a physical like frame picture of, and I'm looking at right now. Like I have like the four main members of the Debbie family with like the appropriate like pride flags and un- 
next to Milo. I have like the pan pride flag and like oh yeah, and another one my other favorite one. Oh yeah, just again just looking at it just because I love the fact that I have these in physical form. We have like also a while ago I commissioned the same artist to make like the Debbie family in like Halloween costumes. So we've got like Big Debbie like dressed as Madame Fleury and Milo as a Wooloo because they're like That's the most, most adorable Pokemon and like my favorite one is like I just like headcanoned Little Debbie which you know if I ever make these characters a thing I'll probably have to change the name a lot just to avoid being sued but like headcanoned Little Debbie as trans and there's a picture of her Halloween costume as Birdo <laughs> That's like my favorite thing because, yep. And another favorite pick, just again, just something I like. It's not subtext. It's not subtext or even subtext in the game, but like another character. Like I've also commissioned fan art of like little Debbie and her recently adopted little baby brother, the orphan of Koss from Bloodborne. Who, for <laughs> those of you who don't know, is this like seven foot tall, like stillborn baby corpse? <laughs> and, you know, the artist toned it down just so it wouldn't look gross because otherwise they're just like, because the thing looks like, you know, a rotting fish on the beach and in the game. But, you know, I put the pic, there's like the frame picture. Hold on. I think I actually have it. Uh, do, 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 on do, do. I've seen, I've seen your Debbie family. I think yeah. the Debbie family is the best. But yeah, I just, I have, but in like the picture of like Lil Debbie with her brother, the orphan of class, like Lil Debbie has the trans flag. And, you know, next to the Orphan of Koss is, like, the non-binary flag, just because, like, you kind of don't know, like, like, one way or the other, just because, like, the Orphan of Koss is, like, this undead abomination that was created to hunt down the things that were hunting down its kin, and this is, like, unnecessarily confused, but, yeah. But, yeah, like... I guess headcanning it as non-binary just because it was because by the time you encounter the character it wasn't able it wasn't born to the point where it could you know decide one way or the other if it had binary right uh, yeah oh yeah and just I guess before we wrap up just I guess something I look up every now and again just because it reminds me of Captain Toad Treasure Tracker, one of my favorite games from the Wii U and now on the Switch. And it says, I mean, there's, as with anything, just like take it with a grain of salt. But it said like, it's, but you know, according to like a whole bunch of video game, online video game websites, it says like during an interview in 2014, Nintendo director Koichi Hayashida, who produced the game Captain Toad Treasure Tracker, revealed that the appearance of a toad does not represent his gender. And I have an exact quote here. Hold on. And he, he said, like, this may be a little a little bit of a strange story, but we never went out of the out of our way to decide on the sex of these characters, even though they have somewhat gendered characteristics. So like the common consensus is that like toad, like the speed. The species of these like short little mushroom people with like giant heads like don't necessarily have genders but like take on gendered characteristics which which i like to think about just because you know toadette is like one of my favorite characters in mario games and like this little piece of and this little nugget of information just makes me like her more and so yeah, this is something I like to think about around this time. I think that's beautiful. I didn't know that that quote was a thing. That's really cool. That's a good. That's a 
I'm going to be thinking about that. Ninten- Nintendo turning out to be the wokest of all. We love it. We stand. That's that's amazing. I mean, they did have like one of the, I think like the first or one of the first like trans characters with Birdo. Yes. And I don't know, may or may not be dating Yoshi because they can't really tell. And then there's, I mean, this again is just like, because I don't think they confirmed one way or the other, but in like Paper Mario, the Origami King, Mario's like adorable little sidekick, Olivia, who's this like little origami girl. Like the only time this really comes up is like there's this ep- there's this one part of the level where you're exploring like a cafe and the cafe kind of looks like and the cafe is like like decorations that look like you know the eight bit like world one one from the original Super Mario Bros, which I just think is a nice touch aesthetically. And like Olivia talks about, oh, I would love to get there's like a coffee up here and chat with the ladies and. Then later on, when you're on a state, when you're on some sort of weird stage show, and Birdo just shows up because, I guess, I mean, you know, she's just there, and like Olivia, who's just like brand new to the larger world, is be like, "Who is she? I love her." So this just makes me just like, I don't know, speculate that Olivia, the character, is lesbian. That is the happiest thing. That is truly the happiest thing. And that's a good note. That's a good note to go. That's a that's a good note to go out on for me. That's that's I can't mm-hmm. top that. That's beautiful. So yeah, I would like to thank you know everyone, the internet's favorite trans mass duck, Kyle, for joining us. And I quack am, quack quack. I am going to make that a thing on merchandise. Like I don't know. Someday, Kyle, you're just going to see, you're going to be like at some manner of pride event and you're just going to like, I don't know, see someone wearing their binder and it's just going to say the words trans mass duck on it. And they're just going to look at you and give you a thumbs up because you have that. Yes, like, I love it. Like, I mean, all we'd really have to do is to, you know, just not have Quaxley on it so that we wouldn't get sued by Nintendo because I would never survive. Neither would I. <laughs> and yeah, and yep, if you like this, just like if you like this slightly nonsensical rambling, you can like and subscribe. And if you'd Pumpkin like copter. to hear Yeah, and if you'd like to hear some like slightly more coherent words and uh, you can find me, my friend Tom, and sometimes Kyle on Gotta Recap Them All, a Pokemon pod where we are recapping literally every single episode of the Pokemon podcast that has been going on since I was nine and I am now 31. And, uh, and you know, just before I wrap, just a little bit, just in the world of Pokemon, God is in the capital G, like, the one what created creation god is like a non-binary horse like it if you go on bulbapedia it explicitly says like you know rcs is like of the genderless gender group alongside the unknown which are like the alpha little alphabet monsters so yeah god is a non-binary horse and yeah where tom and i just do what is like part recapping of one of the most iconic like children's oriented anime and just like it's like anime in general just because of how long it is and uh, yeah kyle is there anything you want to plug before we sign off today um normally i would say follow me on the bird app but the bird app is dying so you can find me on blue sky at, at kyle Podig, my simple name k-y-l-e-p-o-d-d-i-g that again is p is in peter o is in oscar d is in dirt i is in ice cream and g is in garden okay and you know, i'll probably have to think about making those relatively soon but for now for the moment you can find me on the twitters at tgorman83 or just 
look for Big Debbie, where I either promote their show, promote, gotta recap them all, like make tweets where I like say which sort of character a person is most like, or just talk about, you know, I'll just give periodic updates on the list, on my various lists of games I'm playing. And yeah. Until next time, everyone. I mean, it may it may be July now, but happy Pride anyway. I mean, we're now in, which, you know, since June is Gay Pride Month, everyone has just universally agreed that this is Gay Wrath Month. So, yeah. Effectively. And, yep, as I say at the end of every show, have a gourd day, everyone. Have a gourd day.